outset, and it's a virtuous thing that I do this, that I don't really know what I'm talking about, okay? So it would be nice if you guys have questions. You could like ask me the questions. You can either ask them right away or you can wait till the end of the talk. It's fine. Um, and if you have brilliant ideas, then let me know so I can put them in the next time I do this talk and I can take credit. I won't actually steal your ideas. But, um, this talk began, I first gave this talk in 2006. And when I discovered that a couple of days ago, looking at my old notes, it, you know, I had that senior moment thing where you go, my God, that was five years ago. Um, but the ACC had a meeting of the minds research conference here, and they asked me to come talk about something. And it's one of those situations where when someone asks you to do something like this, you're like, yeah, sure, I'll do that, because it's like three months away. There's no problem. And then two months go by, and they send me an email saying, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, ah, I don't really know. You know. And then another month goes by, and I'm like, you know, you need to kind of tell us what you're going to talk about. I'm like, ah, I don't really know. And then like two weeks before I was supposed to give the talk, they said, no, we have to print the program. You have to tell us what you're talking about. So. I still didn't really have any idea what I was talking about, and I thought, well, why don't I just talk about that? Why don't I just talk about the fact that I don't really know what I'm going to talk about? I'll, I'll make you know, ignorance my theme. Um, and that was sort of a, that was a pragmatic reason for doing that. It wasn't sort of a brilliant analysis on my part. On the other hand, it actually turned out pretty well. It was one of those things where the more I thought about, the more I thought there were actually interesting things to say about ignorance. And there's some things to say about ignorance which aren't necessarily earth-shattering, but they're the kinds of things that people wouldn't necessarily think about on their own, which makes for a good kind of generic talk. Um, Seinfeld is oftentimes billed as this show that's about nothing, but all the Seinfeld fans out there know that there's actually more to it than just that. I mean, it's an accurate description in some sense, it's not in others. And so my goal was to sort of plumb the depths of my ignorance and come up with some philosophical terminology to make it sound good and all that kind of stuff. And the talk was a success, although given the nature of my talk today, I should say that I thought it was a success, meaning that people came up to me and said, that was a success. But that didn't necessarily mean that it really was. I just, I have some empirical evidence that it was a success. And then when I was asked to do this talk, uh, the same sort of thing happened. Someone said, would you do a TED talk? And I go, yeah, I guess I could do that kind of thing. And then I'd sort of put it off for a while, put it off for a while. And finally, they said, you really need to tell us what to do. And I said, the last time this happened, I gave a talk about ignorance, which went over pretty well. So I'll just like recycle that bad boy until you give another talk about ignorance. And so that's what I decided to do. I told them I was going to talk about ignorance. And then uh, I have to admit, I am actually an ignoramus, right? Uh, because when I looked at the talk, it was really a couple of days ago, I looked at it again, I'm like, wow, it's been a long time since I gave this talk. I've kind of forgotten most of what was in this talk. So I had to go back and reread the talk, and there was actually a video of me doing that talk, too. I said I had to watch the video, which is always a very painful thing to do, to watch a video of yourself. So I don't intend to watch this video. You guys can tell your friends about it, but I'm not, I'm not going to watch it. Um, and so I, I practice what I preach. I, I, I actually, giving a talk about ignorance, I forgot all the things I had to say about ignorance. I was ignorant about my own talk about ignorance, and then I had to re-educate myself. And I was actually making some notes in the car just like 15 minutes ago, going, oh, I need to change that. Okay, so think about research. Everyone in here here is familiar with the basic concept of research, right? So it's a good, one of the things that philosophers like to do is sort of step back several removes from the trees in the forest and talk about the sort of general terrain in the forest itself. And this is a valuable thing to do sometimes. Research basically begins with ignorance. You don't really know what you're talking about, right? That If you knew what you're talking about, there wouldn't be a whole lot of research to be done there. So you start with ignorance. You become aware of that ignorance, right? If you're not aware of it, you don't really know what to do. Then you formulate questions, and usually you try to find questions that you can actually answer. That's a valuable kind of research project. Then you answer those questions. And then once you answer those questions, those of you who haven't been through this process yet, I can assure you that if it's done well, what happens is you just discover new things that you do not know, and you go back to step one, you start with ignorance, you, you, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an ongoing process over and over again, iterative process, and you can do this for the rest of your life if you're so inclined. Um, but before we talk about ignorance, uh, philosophers really need to talk about the opposite of ignorance. Right? So ignorance is not having knowledge. That's the easiest way to think about ignorance. But then we have the sort of secondary question of, well, what does it mean to have knowledge, right? So consider this sort of scenario I give you. Let's suppose I, I set you a calculus problem. I'm not gonna do it, so don't freak out, but let's suppose I gave you a calculus problem and I, and I want the answer from you. And let's just suppose that amongst you there are several different kinds of people. One person just guesses the answer. Uh, let's see, we'll say uh, you. What's your name? John. John. John just guesses the answer, but he gets it right, right? So John gets the answer correctly. Dwayne back there, Dwayne actually does the problem. And since he can do calculus, he solves it correctly. And then uh, this guy, what's your name? Gordon. Gordon? Yeah, Gordon. Gordon steals the answer from Dwayne. He looks over Dwayne's shoulder, gets the answer, and they all have the answer, right? Now, the question is, 
which one of these people has knowledge? This would be an audience participation thing, so I'm going to be quiet for a second and just kind of look at you. The second one. Second one. So, so Dwayne solved the problem. He has knowledge. Depends on your definition of what Everyone's got it. That's the whole point. That's your definition of knowledge, which we're now going to do. What, how should we think about knowledge? Yeah. We all have knowledge of the answer. Okay. Would you have knowledge of the answer if I didn't tell you that it was the correct answer? Uh, yeah. Ah, mm, yes, no. Does that kind of involve some sort of sense of understanding? What do you mean a sense of understanding? Like, if you understand the problem and what the problem is asking and you can solve the problem versus if you just, like, you can write down an answer but not understand why that answer is an answer. Well, why is that important? Because that indicates whether you know it or not. Why exactly? I don't understand why that's critical to knowledge. Because that's what I think. Oh, okay. That's just what I think. I do not want to have to explain what I think. Do you know? Therefore, why that answer you just gave me is correct or not? Would that count as knowledge? Because by your own criteria, it seems it wouldn't. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, is that just kind of a general trend of it? You know, I mean, it's why we take exams. It's why exams are typically a pain in the butt. And oh, really? Like, so, I mean, we have a so, so do you guys do this on a regular basis on your exams? Solve problems. Really explain why the answer is correct, for example. Well, I mean, it yeah, depends, actually, it depends yeah, on your yeah, discipline yeah. and the kind of exams you take. I mean, with math questions, they sometimes say show your work. So it shows That's true. Your process. With math questions, they do say sometimes show your work. So in a math class, it might not be a bad situation. How about other tests? Have I taken a biochemistry test recently? Oh, God. Were you asked to explain your answers? That was all multiple My guess would be, if you were being honest, you would think to yourself, I hope I don't have to explain my <laughs> answers on the biochemistry test yeah. because I can regurgitate the correct answer having memorized it. But if I'm asked to explain it, God help me. Because I just memorized it, right? Yeah. Okay, so enter a dead white guy. Uh, let's talk about Plato. <laughs> you always have to get a dead white guy in here. He's a pretty dead, very white guy. Um, Plato says, the technical terminology here is that what knowledge is is justified true belief, right? And there's actually two criteria. There's the true belief part, right? And there's the justification part, okay? So having the correct answer, the truth part of the belief, that is necessary. If you do not have the correct answer, you do not have knowledge. Right? We can all agree on that. That's the most obvious aspect of knowledge. Okay? What sometimes people don't really fully realize or appreciate is that that's not enough to give you knowledge. In this particular case, if Duane solves the calculus problem and can explain why the answer is correct, he could be said to have knowledge. But someone who guessed the correct answer or got the answer from Duane could not be said to have knowledge. They do have the correct answer, but they have no way of knowing it's correct. It's correct accidentally. So they got the right answer for the wrong reason, something like that. And unfortunately, failure to appreciate the two-part nature of knowledge is one of the reasons I would argue in a different talk why our educational system is in many ways very superficial. Right? So, so it's, it's not really that important to me so for example, I'm teaching a biology course right now, and it's less important to me that students are able to regurgitate the steps of the Krebs cycle than that they have some idea of what the hell the Krebs cycle does and why anybody should study it, right? And unfortunately, that's not always the way things work. Uh, my son comes home from school sometimes with homework, and you know, one, of the, one of the problems with having a father who's a philosopher, there are probably multiple problems, but one of them is that if you study with them, it's not a straightforward exercise. So my son will sort of say, okay, here's a bunch of terms I have to memorize. And I go, oh, chromatin. I know all about chromatin. Like, what is chromatin? And my son will do what? Repeat what he memorized. Yeah, he will give me the two-sentence definition that's in the manual that he has to memorize, right? And I will say, well, what is it? Yeah, but what is that? Why would anybody make you memorize this term? What does it do? What's it important for, right? What's the difference between a chromatin and a chromosome? And then my son says things like, Dad, you know, it's a matching test. Get off my case. Right? But I would argue, okay, I can, I can tell you what kinds of answers will get you the right answer on the exam. But if it's the kind of thing that you're going to forget in a couple of weeks, what's the point of making you memorize it in the first place? It really isn't. Like stuff. Well, yeah, but that's just saying the whole system is set up that way. Right? And, you know, there's some value to memorizing terminological stuff. Well, because you kind of have to have a language. Sure. You, you can't go, well, you know, the little stuff that's in the cells that, you know, sort of represent the disassociated form. Yeah, but that's too complicated. It's nice to have a term. So there's a certain value to that. The problem is 
that it's not as important as other fundamental concepts. The reason people tend to teach it is because it's very easy to assess. Right? You can very easily write a multiple choice test that will test whether the students have memorized this. And students are OK with that, because students also can memorize this stuff, and then they can regurgitate it. So it's, it's kind of like an a, a evil deal between the teacher and the students. Like, I will give you stuff that's easy to grade, and you will not complain that you're not learning anything important. Right? And if you ever want to make students really upset, you teach a class in a discipline where they normally have those kinds of questions, and you give them an exam which asks them to explain themselves. They get really upset. They're like, all my other classes were like this. You make me do this evil stuff, and it's really hard, and they don't like it, right? Um, when I teach logic, logic is a lot of fun to teach in some ways. You wouldn't think that. Um, but I have fun with logic partly because I can apply this technique. So like in a logic class, there's certain kinds of concepts that you just have to know in order to be able to do the class. One of them is validity. You have to know what validity is, right? And so the basic definition of validity that I make them memorize, and I do make them memorize a couple of things. I say, look, the definition of validity you have to know in this class is an argument is valid if the premises were true and the conclusion must be true. That's the basic condition for a valid argument, right? The problem is that even after they memorize that and they can regurgitate it on quizzes, which I make them do, you know, and then, they, then they're proud of themselves, they do. Got it, right? Then you ask them questions where they apply it. You ask them questions like, well, suppose I have an argument in my pocket and the conclusion's false. Could it be valid? And they'll go, uh, yeah, which is actually the correct answer. But then I can do this kind of thing. I can sort of make the doubting face. Really? So it's, it's got a false conclusion, and yet you think it can be valid? And then what happens? Yeah, no idea. They backtrack. It's, it's beautiful to talk someone out of the right answer. They give you the right answer and you just make sort of a dowdy face and ask a question. They're like, oh yeah, okay, I, I rescind my original answer, time out, that was actually wrong. And then I explain that they had the right answer in the first place, which really pisses them off, right? <laughs> why do you think I do that? Other than the fact that I enjoy making students suffer, why do you think I do that? Force them to think about the correct, how correct the answer is. Right. You've force them to think about something they don't want to think about. And the really beautiful thing is, four or five weeks into the semester, you get students who can no longer be talked out of the right answer. Right? They give you the right answer and you make the dowdy face and you go, I don't know about that. And they're like, no. <laughs> the reason that works is because of this, and you already told me that time, and I can give you four examples of this, and then we both know that they know what they're talking about. Right? And if they get into an argument in Tiger Town over validity, that probably happens all the time, right? they will win because they know what it means. They can't, they're not just regurgitating an answer. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you should be really careful not to get too uh, cocky about this kind of stuff. Uh, how many of you guys are science majors or some sort of engineering science sciencey kind of things? One, one really good exercise to see if you really understand your, your science training is to ask people to explain what statistical significance means. Now, even those of you who aren't science majors should have some passing knowledge of statistical significance. It's such an important concept. But the science majors should really know what it is. And science majors typically, I won't make you do this, but they, they'll typically go, oh yeah, I know what that is. And I ask them what it is, and they tell me how to calculate it, which is not the same. If I ask you what it means, and you tell me how to calculate it, there's a bit of a mismatch. If you ask people what it really means in non-technical terms, it's fairly rare that they can do that. And that suggests that they haven't really thought very carefully. They've memorized some practical application, how to do some kind of computation, but they've never really thought carefully about exactly what it means, right? So try that with your friends. Of course, you, you can all do it, but your friends maybe not. Um, so here's how philosophers work. If you want to know how philosophers go about their business, this is basically how a philosopher does his business. You, you ask a question that nobody else ever thought to ask. Okay, that's the first step. And then you spend a whole lot of time and effort analyzing it in a sort of highly systematic uh, anal kind of way. And then you hopefully, when you do that, you prove a couple of things. You prove, first of all, it's an important question. This is a question that, that people really sort of eternally ask or they can't avoid asking that kind of thing. This is a, an important kind of question in that sense. And we don't seem to have a very good answer to it, right? That's important. Otherwise, people aren't going to spend a lot of time working on it. And finally, that we seem to be making progress in my analysis in some way that's hard to quantify. Otherwise, you know, it might just be a pointless question. So it has to be the kind of question you go, I have defined many terms, and I think we're further along, even though we still can't answer the question, we're better off than we were when I began, right? If you can accomplish that, then you can think about that question for a very long time, thousands of years. We're, we're very good at this kind of stuff. We do, to be fair to philosophy, we do actually solve problems sometimes, but when we solve problems, what happens is we lose those people. Like, 
You know, you solve the, the natural philosophy problem, motion, and electromagnetism, and stuff like that. And then all those people shuffle off and they set up a new department called physics and they pretend they never knew anything about philosophy. That's what happens in philosophy. So by definition, philosophy is like the leftover problems that no one's really solved yet. And every time we solve one, it gets shuffled off. People forget about us. And therefore, we get no credit for all these problems that we solve. People are like, what good is philosophy for? Well, we actually created most of the disciplines on this campus. But you know, that's, so another, that's another talk, right? In a sense, it's the root of all other scientific philosophy. Yes, philosophy used to be called the queen of disciplines. Right? I don't know why it's not the king. But it was called the queen, so whatever. Right? Um, now, dealing with ignorance. We really do not like ignorance. As a culture, we really do not like ignorance. And there's a basic psychological predisposition to avoid things that we do not like, okay? And so what happens is people have developed individually and collectively as a society all kinds of clever ways of avoiding ignorance, right? Usually it amounts to avoiding admission of ignorance or even better, avoiding understanding the ignorance. If you can convince yourself that you're not actually ignorant, that's even better. It makes you much, much more comfortable psychologically, right? But what I want to suggest to you, one of the sort of themes of this talk is that is a pathological condition, and it's something that we really need to fix. People should embrace ignorance, not reject it. If for no other reason than rejecting it leads to bad consequences, right? People don't realize it, but it is true, all right? Um, so, here, here's an unconscious way that you can conceal it from yourself, and I, I had to come up with a, a fancy, uh, at least one fancy philosophical phrase. So I call this meta-epistemic ignorance principle, which means it's a principle about the way in which we know what we know having to do with ignorance. Um, it's always easier to estimate what we know than what we don't know. And this is one of those things that's easy to say, but if you think about it, it's actually kind of an interesting idea, right? You can easily list the stuff you know. Well, I mean, it might take you a while, but it's not like a difficult algorithm. You just make a list. I was once much smaller than I am today. Uh, fire is hot. You know, you can sort of come up with a long list of things you know, and theoretically, at least, you can justify every one of these claims, and you're good, right? But if someone asks you to list the things you don't know, that's a much harder task. You can certainly list some, but how do you know how how representative the sample you listed is of the things you don't know? There may be whole areas of which you are completely ignorant. So you have no idea that the area even exists, much less that you don't know anything about it. And how do you estimate the size, the relative size in particular? Here's what I know. Here's this undifferentiated mass of stuff that I don't know, which is bigger. Right? Which is actually bigger. It's very hard to say. Though if you ask people sort of a gut reaction kind of question, you can get a very quick sort of analysis. Here's something I oftentimes ask my classes. What percentage of the workings of the universe do you think that human beings collectively understand? All human beings on the planet, collectively, how much of the workings of the natural universe do we understand? Zero. Anybody go, it's zero. That's, that's a pessimistic answer. That's really bad. Okay, so anybody over 50? Anybody over 25? Any, anybody for 10? what? 10. Five? Okay, we've got, we've got a taker at five. Five going once. Twice, we'll sell it at five. So, five is like the conservative answer, at most 5% of the universe, right? So, we live in ignorance. That's just a gut check, of course, but nevertheless, it suggests that deep down, if you're honest with yourself, most of the things that you might need to know, you actually don't know, right? Um, and it can, this kind of dilemma, if you don't really think about it, it can lead even people who are very careful normally to make mistakes, right? A student that nevertheless is, is very intellectually driven, they really want to know the answers but they admit that they probably don't have them. That's actually the way you should think about yourself because that's the best way to motivate asking the right kinds of questions, okay? It's all about the questions. Life is all about the questions. Um, ignorance is like excretion. See, I'm a biologist, so it's like excretion. It's entirely unavoidable, all right? And one of the reasons that's interesting is if something's unavoidable like that, it itself is not something we should worry about. You shouldn't worry about the fact that we're ignorant because we're all ignorant in various kinds of ways, just like you shouldn't worry about the fact that we're discreet. What matters is whether or not the ignorance produces or is associated with some other kind of ill effect. That's the question. The ignorance itself is, is at best a marker of something else, right? So you can have ignorance in a situation where competence is assumed. That could be problematic, like your pilot. You assume that your pilot knows what all those switches and dials and buttons and gizmos in the cockpit are. If he does not, 
This is a problem. It's not a problem in general. If he was just some guy standing on the tarmac, it wouldn't matter. But if you're going to assume that he has confidence, it matters. And it also matters greatly if the person in question, the ignoramus in question, does not realize that they're ignorant. Right? That's what I call dangerous ignorance later on. If they don't realize they're ignorant, then they're confident, and that's dangerous. Okay? All right. So let's consider your doctor's ignorance. Right? One of the things I'm going to be doing probably next year is helping out with the new medical school in Greenville. And talking to doctors about these kinds of things is a little touchy. Right? The little touchy is an interesting sort of social community. And ignorance is not one of the things that they spend a whole lot of time talking about. But here's a proposition that I think is, is a reasonable one to hold. Anyone with reasonable scientific literacy who has a medical condition can probably find out more about that condition than their doctor knows about that condition. Why would I say that? Here's more audience participation. Oh, I mean, the doctor has to deal with several different things. They can't just like focus particularly on one aspect. They have to be a little more well-rounded. Yeah. Whereas the patient, okay, you have one condition. It's like, and you, and you're more motivated to know every aspect about it. Right. Why is he a specialist? Nice well, specialist. even the specialist. I mean, consider you know, a specialist. How many different diseases do they have? Oh, yeah. familiar with? Hundreds, at least, maybe thousands. And you've got one. Not only that. It's my disease. I'm highly motivated to find out about that disease. Yeah? A doctor has knowledge and cannot readily admit that he doesn't know. So it's harder, right. for, him, harder for him to, to learn. That's certainly true. And in fact, part of the culture that you pick up when you go to medical school is you learn how to sound like you know what you're talking about, even when you don't. It's, it's considered a critical part of medicine that you cultivate confidence on the part of your patients. Part of the service we pay for. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a silly thing. I mean, to some extent, you know, if you had a doctor who said, golly, I don't know about that stuff. I'm going to have to go look it up on the googly thing. You probably <laughs> wouldn't come back to that doctor, right? The, the problem is sort of the, the, getting the sweet spot just right, getting a doctor who instills confidence but has enough confidence to admit when he doesn't know something. That's, a lot of doctors don't hit that one way or the other, right? Um, but what, what can really cause a problem is if the doctor is unwilling to admit that they don't know something, and then they act on that. Oh, like, yeah. if you tell them something and they go, yeah, yeah, you, this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about, when in fact you do. Or they treat you in a way that's no longer the current standard because they haven't bothered to find out about the current standard, they don't know about it. Right. If you're interested in this kind of question, I really recommend this book. It's called How Doctors Think by Jerome Brookman. He's a doctor at Harvard who had a, some kind of wrist condition and became a patient. And then he sort of was really taken by the way he was treated as a patient as opposed to as a doctor. And one of his main theses is that to be a good doctor, one of the skills you have to cultivate is constantly keeping an open mind really listening to your patient, really understanding that the, the answer that first comes to mind might not be the correct one. And that's difficult because a lot of doctor's training is to make decisions fast, right? And this is a completely different kind of thing. After you've dealt with 5,000 kids with middle ear infections, every kid becomes a middle ear infection. But the problem is, every now and then, it's something completely different. And you have to be aware, sort of alert to that possibility, which is difficult psychologically to pull off. Okay, in other words, ignorance really isn't the problem at all. It's not, ignorance is not the problem. It's when we fail to fess up to our ignorance. That's when the problem begins. It's a bit like you know, a political scandal, as they oftentimes say about a political scandal. It's not the political scandal that got you in trouble, with, really, ultimately. It's the cover-up that always gets you in trouble, right? It's not the fact that you slept with an intern. It's the fact that you lied about sleeping with an intern, right? If you just, at the very beginning of the scandal, said, yeah, I did some really stupid stuff, I'm sorry. It probably would blow over, but if it turns out that you lied and destroyed evidence and you know, like got people fired in order to try to cover up the scandal, then people really get very upset. Same kind of thing here. Being ignorant is fine, but when you don't admit it and you act on it, that's more problematic, right? Because when you admit it, the ignorance doesn't really direct your actions. If I say, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm not going to act on any pet theories that might be floating around in my head, right? And it can be fixed. If I say, I don't know what I'm doing, someone can come up and say, well, let me teach you what you need to know in order to do this. Okay? But if I don't admit it, then people just assume that I know what I'm doing. Um, so we, what we really need to do is, is have a culture which tries to embrace ignorance. It, it sounds like a really weird claim. And maybe many of you would think I'm crazy for saying it, but hopefully like in a day or two, 
it'll sink in. You go, no, no, Kelly maybe wasn't as crazy as I thought he was, and he made that claim about embracing ignorance, right? Maybe, maybe after a while, your ignorance about ignorance will, will lift, and you'll be enlightened. Oh, there's a typo. Okay. So the very worst thing you could possibly do is, of course, what we typically do, right? The worst thing you could possibly do is when some, someone comes forward and says, I don't really know the answer to this question. I don't know how to do this. If you punish them, right? If you punish them for that, then they very quickly learn in self-defense, do not admit I am ignorant, right? If I, if I can possibly pull it off, what I want to try to do is develop some mechanism so I don't even have to admit to myself that I'm ignorant. That way, not only do I look good, but I feel good. If I have to admit it to it myself, but I conceal it from others, I look good, but I don't feel so good. But if I can figure out a way not ever to admit it to myself, then I feel really good about myself. But this is exactly what you don't want, right? This just pushes the problem underground <coughs> and you can't see it until it literally starts to cause problems. You don't know that your doctor doesn't know how to do a chest tube until he tries to do a chest tube and kills someone. And then you go, oh, I guess he never learned the chest tube thing in medical school. Got it, All right? I don't know if you can actually kill someone with a chest tube. I guess it's pretty theoretically possible because how bad you are at it. Um, now, one of the things that philosophers like to do is we like to produce schema. So you know, we have some sort of concept like BS or whatever, and we like to like come up with a categorization scheme so that we can sort of conceptualize it in different kinds of ways. One of these days, I'm going to write a paper about the different varieties or species of idiots. You know, idiot is one of those interesting terms. There's different ways in which you can be an idiot, right? Like you can be an idiot in the, just in the sense you don't know a lot, or you can be an idiot in the sense that you have spectacularly bad judgment in it. You always make the wrong decision. Right? So the word idiot is actually a very rich word, and there's there's a journal, the Journal of Irreproducible Results, which publishes these kinds of things. So one of these days, I'm going to put paper in there. I'll probably do a paper also about how to optimize pizza toppings. That's another good thing. One of these days, I'll do these kinds of things. Anyway. Uh, Philosophers can get really tedious with the sort of categorization thing, so I'm not going to do too much of it. I'll just give you a little, little taste of what philosophers would do with something like this. Um, okay, so first of all, we got plain vanilla ignorance, sort of basic ignorance. This is a situation where there's some truth that other people know, right? And Bob, our interlocutor, he doesn't know it, but Bob is aware that he doesn't know it, right? That's pretty prosaic, ordinary kind of ignorance, right? It's plain, it's not, there's like all that interesting, right? Everyone has this all the time, it's very easy to recognize, and relatively speaking, it's easy to fix. This is what happens to you when you're studying for the final exam and you have anxiety. You go, there are things that may be on the final exam. I do not know them. <laughs> this causes anxiety. Right? And, and, and this is a motivation to open the book and try to figure out what they are and then learn them. So it can actually be productive, right? But there's nothing really weird about that particular kind of ignorance. That's the, that's the most obvious kind, okay? Then there's dangerous ignorance, which in some ways is the most interesting kind. There's some truth that other people know, but Bob does not know it. And here's the important bit. Bob doesn't know he doesn't know it. So Bob rejects either premise one or two. So either he thinks there isn't some truth that other people know, or he thinks he does know it. It doesn't really matter for our purposes which of those two it is. Bob believes he knows something when in fact he does not. And that's the kind of thing that will get people killed, right? Because when you think you know something, you will act with confidence, right? Stand back, I know what to do, right? Your wife might be thinking, no, you don't know what to do at all. Do not listen to this man, right? But if she's not there to say that, other people will mistake your confidence for actual competence, right? And there are psychological studies which show that, for example, in court, when people testify, if you have two, test two witnesses, one witness testifies in sort of a uh, guarded way. I'm pretty sure that was the guy. It was kind of a dark night, but I got a good look at his face. I think that was probably him. Versus, I am positive that is the right guy. I would bet my life. There's no way I could possibly forget that face. Juries interpret the second guy as being more likely to be correct. Guess what? There's no correlation. That's a personality trait. That's how likely the person is to believe they're correct, which is not the same as being correct, right? So juries tend to believe the guy that has no qualifications, whereas you know the guy that is qualified might actually have thought more carefully about what he's saying. Anyway. Um, uh, false confidence means that there's no caution, and you know, the phrase uh, to screw things up truly well requires a computer, that's because computers don't have a sense of caution. Computers just do stuff. They don't reflect. They don't worry about what they don't know. They just do whatever they're programmed to do. Um, here's my standard example. Let me do the chess tube. I've watched every episode of ER. 
I have watched every episode of VR. I've done drinking games with chest tubes. I think I could probably do a chest tube. Would you like me to give it a try? That's okay. You'd be my first case. And I, I'm pretty confident I can do it, save your life, and not kill you. But I'm not positive. Never done it. Right? But if I'm the kind of person who's like extremely confident, oh, that's easy. I'll just do that. No problem. Then I might kill someone. Right? I don't really know how I could screw up a chest tube. It looks easy on an emergency room. They never screw anybody up that badly. But maybe there's some little artery down there that I might nick. And then the next thing you know, I killed you. And I'm like, oh. Sorry, I had the best of intentions, right? And we all know someone who has dangerous ignorance. I won't get into that too terribly much. Okay, fixing dangerous ignorance. It can be really difficult to fix dangerous ignorance. You're, you're basically in the position of going to someone who has dangerous ignorance, and the first thing you have to tell them is, Bob, I know you think you know what you're talking about, but you don't. Right? And because we have a culture which doesn't embrace ignorance, this is considered a deep insult. And Bob's going to get really upset. And chances are, Bob's not going to really take what other words come out of my mouth very well. It's hard to do this politely. Right? It's actually something philosophers do a lot. Right? We're in a lot of positions where we, we're in a class or something, and students think they know something, and they start talking to us, and we're like, I know you think you know what you're talking about, but in fact, you don't. Right? Now, in a class, you can get away with it, because the students have to just kind of suck it up. But it's hard to do that in a social setting and get away with it, right? Just to give you a couple of examples, I teach uh, creationism and evolution kinds of classes a lot of times, and there are people who are extremely sincere about creationism, and they'll say things like, well, evolution is just a theory, right? And of course, in a way, they're right about that. It's just that the implications are completely wrong. It takes a while to unpack that, but first you have to explain to them that they don't know what they're talking about. Or, is just a theory. Say what? Gravity is just a theory. Exactly. It is just a theory. I think the way I put it is, it's a theory. I just don't like the just. The pejorative just, I don't like that. If you make the just go away, I'm cool. It is a theory. Okay. We're all right. 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 Um, or in ethics, I teach a lot of ethics classes, and people a lot of times will have this idea that it's just incredibly obvious that there's nothing to ethics but personal opinion or social mores, which you can argue for, but it is not obvious. And what I have to tell students is, most of you who say that don't actually believe it. You just haven't thought about it carefully enough to realize you don't actually believe it. It's just words that come out of your mouth, but when I really think about them, they don't hold water. If you really want to, we can get into that a little bit later on. Now there's fruitful ignorance. Fruitful ignorance, this is fruitful, we like that. Nobody knows the truth, but everybody believes that there is a truth that we can access, and everybody understands that they don't know what the truth is. Right? And this is a situation where it's good for research projects. This is what you want your thesis to explore. Someone goes, nobody knows this. You can find it out. Go do it. When I was in grad school in biology, I worked on buckeye butterflies. And I basically read every article ever published about buckeye butterflies, which weren't that many, it's maybe 50, right? And so I knew exactly what they didn't know about buckeye butterflies. I had all kinds of research projects. None of them were hard to do. It's just there's lots of things nobody ever thought to really look into with buckeyes. And you just pick one and you do it. It's pretty straightforward, right? Um, that's the beginning point of research. For example, uh, why is it that women reach sexual maturity nowadays much earlier than they did 100 years ago? We know this is true. We figure there's got to be a reason for it. It's probably findable if you set up a large enough study and study enough variables, but no one's found the answer to it. So if you want to, there's a thesis project for you right there. Just the next five years working on that, you get your PhD, life will be good, right? But then there's earth-shaking ignorance. Earth-shaking ignorance is a situation where experts believe something's true. You believe they're wrong, and you believe the truth is knowable. Okay? That's earth-shaking kind of ignorance. Uh, now, the problem with earth-shaking ignorance is spending time working on earth-shaking ignorance does not often pan out. So, like, if your advisor is really into some earth-shaking problem and he gives you that as a thesis project, he's not doing you a favor. Because the chances of you actually being able to complete the thesis are very small. On the other hand, if you do complete a thesis along those lines, then you're likely to get the call to go to Stockholm. That's the kind of thing they hand out Nobel Prizes for. It's like, it's like a high-risk research project, okay? Um, are we sure the Earth is at the center of the solar system? That's an old one, right? If you want a more current one, is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics really true, or is it just a useful fiction? And I won't talk about the Copenhagen interpretation. That's another one, okay? Um, well, I'm glad. <laughs> but is it true? That's the question. And lastly, we have philosophical ignorance, right? We recognize there's a truth, but either... Nobody has any idea what it is, or 
There are lots of people who think they know what it is, but they have different kinds of answers, and all the evidence for the different kinds of answers is equally good or equally bad. So it's completely unclear who's got the right answer, or even if one of those is the right answer, right? But it, does, it doesn't really seem knowable, at least no time soon, right? That's what philosophers do. This is the kind of thing that philosophers do. The closer these problems come to being soluble, the more they get exported into other disciplines. So this is where philosophers do our work, right? Um, and thinking about them can be a useful heuristic, even if you don't solve the problem. If nothing else, philosophers are intimately aware with ignorance. They, they understand ignorance at a very deep level, and we have no problem admitting we're ignorant, in a way that people in other disciplines oftentimes don't. Right? A scientist, if you ask them, are you sure about that, for any scientific claim, what should she say? No. She should say, no. I have excellent evidence. I would bet you a large sum of money that I'm right about this. But I'm not sure. Is that what scientists always say? <laughs> no. But a philosopher, no problem. We, we probably make terrible witnesses in a court. Because if someone asks me, are you sure that was the man that murdered your wife? I'll go, well, I'm not really sure that I'm not dreaming right now. There are many things I'm not really sure about. I think there's a high problem. And then I'm a terrible witness. People go, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, right? Because I'm not pounding my fist and things like that. Right? So, for example, what is the mind? What really is the mind? Is it just the brain? Is it something else? How do we describe that? Or how did time begin? Right? These, are, these are good questions in the sense that it would be nice if we had an answer to them. Does it look like we're going to get the answer anytime soon? And there are lots of different answers. It's really unclear how do you adjudicate between the different kinds of answers. Alright, so here's some practical suggestions. I'm almost done, so you can know. Not, you know, you're almost there. Uh, plain vanilla and dangerous ignorance are excellent ways about thinking about the rational pathologies of students. So people like me can teach students a lot. We, we constantly are in a position to try to figure out how our students are thinking. It's like, they seem to be thinking in a weird way. What's going on? What's the pathology that produces this weird behavior? You have to sort of reverse engineer your students' minds. Okay? You know, I think they're thinking something like that, right? Um, if you don't know what your students don't know, it's really hard to teach. This is one of the first things people find out when they start teaching is, it's not enough to know what all the correct answers are. What you really need to know is, my students believe X, right? The truth is Y, so I gotta figure out how to get them from X to Y. If you just tell them Y, they won't get it, many of them, and you have to figure out a way to sort of explicitly lead them from what weird stuff they believe to the truth, right? Um, but you can't get cocky because no matter how hard you try, you're always going to be infected with dangerous ignorance on your own. This is something you just have to keep in mind. It's always there. It's kind of like bias. You know, Everyone has various kinds of biases. You don't want to tell someone you have no biases. If someone tells me that they don't have a biased bone in their body, I think you're just not very honest with yourself. Right? Everybody has biases. The healthy way to deal with biases is just to admit that you're not perfect and you've got these kinds of things and then you try to look for their influence and get rid of it as much as you can. But you can't say it's not there. Everybody's got them, at least nowadays. Maybe in a thousand years we'll, we'll raise people who don't have any biases of any kind. Um, secondly, when you're looking for ordinary research projects, like a thesis or something like that, go for fruitful research, right? Uh, there's, there's lots of fruitful research that you can do. You find out everything there is to know about some little area of human intelligence, and you will figure out there's 87,000 questions to ask. You can ask one, you can solve it. You're not going to get the trip to Stockholm out of it, right? You can make a career out of it. If you do it over and over and over again, you can make a career out of it. You can sort of nibble away at the, the mountain that is our ignorance. But, you know, it's a perfectly workaday kind of way of doing things. However, what I tell a lot of times, especially the scientists and technical colleagues, is you really should spend some time, consciously budget time, to think about earth-shaking kinds of ignorance. A lot of times, people who are pressed for time, they don't do this. They just concentrate on the sort of solvable problems. But you should spend some of your time thinking about the really weird problems. Kind of like when you're doing an investment portfolio. You know, you might want to have 5% of your portfolio that you put in tech stocks. Right? They might not do well, but they might return 80%. So you put a little bit of your money in the tech stocks, you hope that maybe they'll return. Most of your money's in the boring stuff, you know, the GEs of the world, and the stuff that's not going to do anything sexy, could give you a nice steady return. But some money and other kinds of things is not a bad idea. This is especially true when you're young, because young people have these wonderful qualities. They're eager, they're naive, right? And they have no vested interests. They, they're not the person who says that this theory is correct. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, and they know they don't know what they're talking about. So they're perfect for this kind of work, right? You have to schedule time, and when you schedule time, the trick is, even if you're young and naive and eager and all that kind of stuff yourself, you want to interact with people who are even younger and more naive and more ignorant than you are, and then you buy them beer, and you talk about these kinds of things. 
right? There's something like beginner's luck in these kinds of things because people who don't know that much about it will ask the right kinds of questions. They'll go, well, why should they believe in the Copenhagen interpretation? Nobody that's been doing physics for 30 years asked that question anymore. But the guy that just started graduate school, he go, I don't know, I've always had this funny feeling about the Copenhagen interpretation. That's the kind of person you want to have a beer with, right? And one, th one sort of very practical thing you can do is you can sort of sit down and list the main beliefs that people in your discipline have, whatever the discipline is. And we believe like five things, and then ask yourself, is there really good evidence for these things? Are there alternate interpretations that we can come up with that we might be able to make an argument for? You're probably not going to get one. But at least it's fun. It's a lot of fun to do this occasionally, especially over beer. This is one of the reasons why you have beer, so you don't get just too crust, right? Um, and like I say, we should really work at cultivating a culture of ignorance. Learn to say, I have no idea with pride. Not many of us can pull that off, but that's actually not a bad thing to say. Reward others for asking questions that you can't answer. So when a student or somebody asks you a question you can't answer, you should say, that is an excellent question. It is so good, I cannot answer it. Right? That's a good thing you came up with that. Raise your children to be annoyingly independent thinkers. I, I've tried to do this on my own, and I can tell you that it is extremely annoying when your kids get old enough to actually be able to argue with you effectively. You have to say things like that. Yeah, that's actually a good point. All right, you can have dessert. I guess you've caught me in the inconsistency of my principles. Damn it. <laughs> but it's a good thing. In the long run, it's a good thing, right? Um, find the tendency to get complacent about your knowledge. The, one of the things that happens as you get older is you know more and more stuff, and you're more and more familiar with all the stuff you know, and how little other people who are younger than you know, and so you tend to just stop worrying about what you don't know, and that is something you need to fight. Like, as you get older, you need to sort of actively force yourself to consider things you do not know that much about, right? What would the world look like if everyone acted this way? I think that's an interesting thought experiment. If you, if you could somehow wave your magic wand and make people do this, how would that change the way the world is? I would argue it would make it a much better place. But make it more interesting. It certainly make it more interesting, more honest, if nothing else. And I will leave you here with this quote by a famous guy. Uh, that started with a dead white guy. Here's a, that's actually another dead white guy, but that's not what I have in mind here. Before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I am still confused, but on a higher level. This is Enrico Fermi, the nuclear physicist, after hearing a talk on quantum physics. And this is funny, but there's also some truth to this, right? You don't necessarily have to have the answer in order to have made progress. And sometimes, Socrates would say, for example, sometimes understanding that your ignorance is legitimate progress all by itself, even if that's all you come away from with. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. I will shut up now, and hopefully you guys have questions and things that you want to ask me. Otherwise.